show, top of the hour on a Friday with President Biden getting ready for yet another test of his candidacy. He is about to hold a rally in Michigan as more Democrats are, and donors are pushing for him to drop out. We'll look at whether there's any way for him to change their minds. Plus, pretty much all of the customers of one of the country's biggest cell phone companies are victims of a hack. Their call and text records stolen. We'll tell you what was taken in this massive breach and how you can make sure your data is safe. Plus, the heat wave just keeps rolling on and the blackout. They've turned deadly in Houston. We're live on the ground as thousands may not have their power back for days. Are you kidding me? And high drama drama today at the Alec Baldwin trial in New Mexico. The claim his lawyers are making that could get that case thrown out. We'll tell you how it all played out in front of the cameras. Then, why West Coast dams are being blown up so a river can be restored to its past glory. That's coming up in tonight's original. Good day, I'm Tom Costello. I am in for Halley, and tonight we start with President Biden still holding on despite more Democrats turning on him. One Democratic lawmaker telling Mr. Biden he should step aside, telling him face to face, that according to several sources, and more donors are turning away. In just an hour from now, we're going to see President Biden hit the campaign trail in Michigan at the podium right there. You're looking live in yet another test of his candidacy. And right now, though, he is in Northville, Michigan at a campaign organizing event at a bar with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. He's speaking live. There's a live shot and he is speaking. We're listening. If we will, we will tell you rather if he says anything that we think we need to break in and inform you about. As we are just now hearing reports that some of the biggest Democratic donors in the country are withholding a whopping $90 million in funds as long as President Biden stays in the race. That according to two sources who talked to the New York Times. But President Biden remains defiant, defending his fitness for office in that big news conference just 24 hours ago. The president sticking to his script that he is not going anywhere unless his team comes to him and says there's no way he'd win. Now, some of his campaign staff are telling our team exactly that. But it's not clear if they're taking that message directly to the president. And the view on Capitol Hill really is just more uncertainty with the president joining calls with members of key congressional caucuses today. Here's the big question. Could the president possibly stop the political bleeding? Because take a look at this. More and more Dems are still coming out, even in just the last few hours, calling on the president to drop out. Our team is talking to voters on the ground, former Biden voters who now want him to step aside. Take a listen. I love that man. He's done more for black people than any president I know. I think it's time for him to step down. I was a Biden supporter right up until the debate. Uh, now I really would like to see an open convention. All right, we've got team coverage. NBC's Julie Serkin is posted on Capitol Hill. But we begin with Monica Alba, who is at the White House. And Monica, the pressure on Biden uh, not letting up. You've got this new reporting about a Democrat calling on the president to drop out uh, in a video call late today, not to mention major donors now freezing their money unless he drops out, right? Exactly, Tom. And the president has said it all week long. He's dug in. He's defiant. He intends to stay in this race. But now he is having the opportunity to hear from at least one House Democrat who has gone on the record and publicly called for him to step aside and leave the race. And that is Congressman Mike Levin, who we understand was a part of this video call earlier today with some other House Democrats who we are told said to the president, look, I respect you for your service and your decades in public office. And I know that Democrats want to rally around this desire to beat Donald Trump in November, but it is time for new leadership. And I think respectfully, Mr. President, you should pass the torch. And so that is what he told the president. And according to a source that was really uh, a part of this, they told us that the president responded saying, look, I understand. I acknowledge your concerns. I know they're valid, but I'm going to keep getting out there. I'm going to do exactly what you see him doing there on that side of the screen. I'm going to continue to talk to voters. I'm going to continue to try to make sure that people can kind of feel like some of their anxieties or concerns might be answered, like what he's doing now in today in Michigan, Tom. Yeah, you know, the president is just under such a microscope. His every move monitored and critiqued. What 
what might he say or do to try to turn a, a page here? That seems like a huge challenge. And it does feel like every single day we're talking about some new benchmark with which to evaluate it. And it was that first major network interview, and then it was some of those campaign stops, and then it was this press conference last night to wrap up NATO. Now it's perhaps Monday's pivotal interview with our own colleague, Lester Holt, and then a couple of other campaign events that he's going to be having in Texas and Nevada that follow. So I think basically everything the president is now doing publicly will continue to be scrutinized, but according to his campaign, campaign, according to the yeah. White House. He is just trying to be out there. And they have conceded that maybe he hasn't had as many unscripted moments as he should have had. And they're going to attempt to rectify that in part. Tom. Uh, by the way, Monica, as you speak, if the president says anything about staying in or dropping out of the race, we'll dip back in. But let's just say people close to the president somehow convinced him to step aside. What would the process look like for presumably Vice President Harris to become the nominee? That's not just an overnight quick fix, right? Right. And I have to say, Tom, I think really, truly, it will be completely up to Joe Biden to make that decision. And even if there are people that come to him and tell him that there's no path or that there's an issue, again, that will still really reside with him and him alone. But let's say that he does down the line come to that conclusion and decides that he isn't going to be the Democratic nominee. The thinking and the kind of what he laid out last night in this press conference is that he would essentially back his vice president. He said, I wouldn't have chosen Kamala Harris to be my running mate if I didn't believe that she could be president. But in terms of the infrastructure and some of the millions that have been raised, that is what would go to her directly. It would be far more complicated if there were a larger conversation about the delegates. But if he decided that essentially it would be her, then those delegates would be her own. And then the money and the staff that's already been raised would be transferred to her if that decision were to take place. Though, again, we're told the president says he is still in this and does yeah. not intend to leave the race. Yep, it's a very big uh, if. All right, thank you, Monica. Let's go to Julie Sirkin now. She's uh, on Capitol Hill. Julie, give us the gut reality check there. The, the president joined calls with lawmakers earlier today, and things, I understand, got rather tense. What are you hearing from lawmakers? Yeah, Tom, he joined two separate calls today. He has at least two more on the hook tomorrow with different factions of the Democratic caucus as he hears from members directly expressing their concerns. Today, he had two meetings, one with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, where, as you heard Monica report, our sources told us that uh, Mike Levin, who became the latest Democrat in just the last couple of hours to publicly call on Biden to pass the torch, as he said in a statement, a Democrat from California, he told Biden directly on this call, according According to our sources, three different things here. He said, one, look, Mr. President, I respect your record. Of course, this is not a direct quote. This is just a summary of what he told Biden. I respect your record, but we need to put the strongest candidate forward to win in November against Donald Trump. He said that that is not Biden at this time, asking him again, of course, to pass the torch. So really interesting that these are having direct conversations between the president and members on these calls who are very concerned in recent days, given that debate performance and everything since. Yeah, and one of the most influential lawmakers on the Hill with, with deep ties to the president was on the Today Show this morning. Let's play just a piece of that, what he told Craig Melvin. Hypothetically, if the president does decide to step aside and it's Vice President Harris, does she have your full-throated endorsement? Absolutely. No question about that. She has acquitted herself well in the job as vice president, and he never would have picked her in the first place if he did not think that she was capable of being president. Well, it's clearly a problem when a president loses members of his own party on Capitol Hill. Where does it go from here? Tom, that count up to 19 now with the addition of Mike Levin that I was just telling you about. Five total since Biden's press conference yesterday, his news conference closing out the NATO summit uh, that sources have told me neither moved the needle, n didn't move the needle in either direction, that people who had their minds made up continue to hold the same posture after that press conference. Of course, you had a few frontliners joining the call for that, including Levin. That is something that the president is paying attention to. But so far, no intention of stepping aside. Tomorrow, he'll have more calls with the Progressive Caucus and some frontliners as well, Tom. Julie Sirkin on Capitol Hill. Thank you, Julie. Uh, tonight, the FBI is investigating a massive AT&T breach that has compromised millions of American cell phone calls and texts. 
AT&T says hackers stole six months worth of call and text message records earlier this year from nearly all of its cellular customers, more than 100 million people. You see the dates coming up here. The company says hackers stole records related to May 1st to Halloween 2022 and then again on January 2nd, 2023. The content of the calls and the messages not compromised. But the records included phone numbers, and cyber pros say it would be relatively easy for hackers to match those numbers with personal information already out there on the dark web and determine who's calling and texting whom. Let's bring in NBC's data reporter Brian Chung for more on this. Brian, I, I talked to uh, several cyber pros today who say this data could compromise private information about who you're calling, texting, confidential police informants, medical information, national security sources. Really, it could be invaluable to a foreign country or even organized crime. Yeah, and what makes all this even more alarming is the breadth of how many people are affected by this. So by some estimates, it's over 109 million people because this affects virtually every phone call and text message that was done on AT&T over that six-month period in 2022. And naturally, a lot of people are going to be asking the question, well, why is it that we're only hearing about this now in 2024? Well, on one hand, uh, AT&T says that it itself was only aware of this uh, breach as of April of this year. And then between April and now, it had essentially been working with the Department of Justice and the FBI to try to find those behind this particular data breach before disclosing it publicly. And the AT&T did say that they have apprehended at least one person. But I want to emphasize the data contains phone numbers. So if you and I texted each other during that period in 2022, they would have the phone numbers associated with those interactions, but they would not have yeah. the content of those calls or texts. That's a very important distinction, Tom. Absolutely. But, for example, if I'm a journalist and you're a whistleblower and... Uh, you and I are texting back and forth. It's a big deal. The concern is that information will be valuable to whoever the whistleblower is kind of re is is talking about, right? Whether it's a company, whether it's a government agency, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And really serious stuff there, which is why it's kind of a, a, a secondary uh, reaction here over how this was able to ha how was how this was happening to such a large company. And, you know, I know that you spoke with someone over at CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency that has said this really underscores the need to strengthen the infrastructure within uh, these private carriers in terms of defending themselves from a yeah. breach like this. They say that they're trying to take cybersecurity measures on AT&T's end. They're going to contact customers and they are continuing to work with law enforcement of, uh, officials at the FBI. FBI and the DOJ to try to get their heads around this, Tom. Yeah, the U.S. cybersecurity chief told me, listen, we got to start treating these telecom companies like they are critical infrastructure companies. They need to have even better and more robust defenses. Brian, Absolutely. always on the story. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. All right, we're learning today about another reported death in the midst of that brutal Houston heat wave and blackout. A 93-year-old woman had passed away in the elder facility, facility, elder care facility where she lived. The medical system there has been just pushed to the breaking point with at least a dozen hospitals still relying on backup generators. Roughly 875,000 people in Houston are still without power as of this morning. Houston's electricity provider hopes to get power restored to 80% by Sunday night. People are going to social media there to share their experiences. Take a look. Luckily, we were able to find some ice, so we got some cold drinks at least. And really the only <clears throat> relief we've found is putting like towels in the ice water and just putting them around our necks or our backs. Boy, brutal. It's not just Houston. The entire West Coast is is really just melting triple digit temperatures across the region. We've got team coverage. Our correspondent Priscilla Thompson and meteorologist Bill Karens standing by to cover every angle of this extreme heat. Priscilla, let's start with you um, out there in the heat. So sorry. Tell us about this woman who died there and the efforts to provide relief for all the vulnerable people. Yeah, Tom, well, I will say we're getting a bit of rain right now, which is cutting into some of that heat, but obviously creating problems with regard to trying to get the power back on. But I want to give you a quick look at where we are. We're here at a distribution site where folks are able to line up and they're going to be getting ice. They're going to be getting water. There are also some bags of non-perishable down, non-perishables down there. And so this is one of the ways that people right now are getting by without having electricity, unable to keep food inside of their uh, 
um, refrigerators. And we've been speaking to folks who are out um, in these lines, and this is what they're doing right now to get by. But as you mentioned, we have been seeing extreme heat, and that uh, has caused some deaths. We're talking about um, this 93-year-old woman, Barbara Sturgis, her son saying that the heat may have been a factor in her death. She was at this independent uh, living facility where they were using backup generator power to cool a lot of the common areas. And he said that he went there on Tuesday and he felt like the temperature was okay. But when he went Thursday morning, when he was notified of his mother's death, uh, he says that it was extremely hot in there. And that facility has said that they are very sorry about this tragic loss and doing all that they can to sort of keep their residents. But certainly a concern for the elderly and those who are sick as we're still dealing with hundreds of thousands without power and the high temperatures. Tom? Yeah, and the heat is just so extreme for people who have no place to go, right? It can really be life or death, especially for the elderly and the poor. Yeah, you're talking about people who are trying to, some people have, we've been encountered in these lines are sleeping in their cars. They've been going back and forth to cooling centers. I met one couple that has uh, their three grandchildren with them and they're just struggling right now. I want to play some of what they shared with me about how they're making things work right now. But we got to do what we got to do to keep the kids, you know, fed and cool. And the only way we got money this time, we had to make sure a porn shop was open. So we can pawn our ring off yeah, just to get gas. You all pawned your wedding rings to yeah, get gas? Yeah, just to get food. Just to get gas and food. Yeah. Yeah, that's how hard it is. And that couple told me that they had to throw away $600 worth of food. And you heard there, that's money that they don't have to waste. And so right now, they're just trying to keep gas in their car to get to distribution sites like this and get to cooling centers as they wait to see when their power is going to be restored. Centerpoint says they hope to restore 400000 by the end of the day today. But there will certainly be some people going into next week still without power. Tom? You know, that really drives it home. So many people are living so close to the edge. They had to pawn their wedding rings. Uh, Priscilla Thompson, thank you very much. Uh, it's not just Texas scorching in that summer heat. Of course, the whole region is hot, hot, hot right now. And let's go to be meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, everybody there is asking how yeah. long will we have to live through this heat and the West? How long will they have to live through this heat? Yeah, and Tom, I'm just commenting on the, you know, the scene there with Priscilla is a lot of people always say it's the aftermath of the hurricane that is a lot worse than the hurricane itself. So a lot of people would say, you know, the hurricane wasn't too bad. We didn't get a lot of damage. And then here you are five, six days later without power, just trying to survive and live. I mean, you know, living in the deep south uh, you know, on the Gulf Coast without power is not pretty this time of year. Uh, this is the absolute peak of the heat season, too, usually in the middle of July. So Houston's still under a heat advisory. Now we've had to Kansas City and Omaha heat uh, watches in effect for Philadelphia. That's for what's coming next, the beginning of next week. We just tied the record high for today in Denver. Denver's at 101. Grand Junction's at 102. We're talking mountainous areas here. Salt Lake City's 103 right now. In Vegas, you were getting close to that record today. Same with Phoenix and also had many areas in interior California. And as I mentioned, that heat is just going to spread, Tom. We're going to see the hundreds spreading into the middle of the country and then it all comes to the East Coast. Here's looking at you, Tom, wow. on Tuesday. 100 and one in D.C. Mm. You know, I grew up in Denver. I don't ever remember 100 degree days when I was a kid. I mean, it just was unheard of. Listen, talk about the remnants of Hurricane Barrel. They're, they're gone, but the tropical air and the flood threat remains here in the Northeast, right? Yeah, we had a lot of flash flood problems, especially in Virginia, heading out of the Virginia Beach, the Norfolk area. And now we're watching the heaviest rain here outside of Raleigh and Richmond. Eventually, this is all going to drift northwards tonight, and the ground's already saturated a little bit. All the maroon colors here is where we have flash flood warnings, and the flash flood watches do include Richmond. They do not include D.C., but up towards Baltimore, Philly, New York, Hartford, and Boston, all included in this. That's why we got 43 million people. It's hit and miss, though, Tom. Not everyone yeah. is going to get soaked by this. Some areas will get very little, or some Someone else could get four or five inches of rain. You know, we could use the rain, though. I tell you, every yeah. single patch of grass here has turned brown in the Washington, yeah. D.C. area. Uh, Bill, thank. we'll, uh, thanks. We'll check back with you in an hour or so. It is nonstop drama in the courtroom in Alec Baldwin's manslaughter trial. Just hours ago, the defense dropped a bombshell, accusing the state of burying evidence. If the judge agrees, the whole case could be thrown out. Here's the moment the judge opened a sealed envelope, an evidence envelope, taking her first look at a set of live rounds that could call into question the source of the bullet that killed cinematographer Haley Hutchins. At least that's what Baldwin's attorneys are saying. 
Uh, here he is arriving in court today. Prosecutors say this is all just a wild goose chase. The jury has been sent home for the weekend while the judge considers this new allegation. NBC legal analyst Danny Savalos is standing by. But first, let's bring in our own Dana Griffin. She's been following the twists and the turns of this trial. Uh, Dana, what's the story with this evidence? Why haven't we heard about this particular set of live rounds before? Well, it's a good question, Tom. We just learned moments ago in court because, again, this motions hearing has been going on for hours and it's happening as we speak. We just heard from the lead detective in the case that these rounds who were brought in by a friend of the armorer's father, who is also a fellow Hollywood armorer, he brought these in first to the courtroom on March 6th. That happens to be the day that Hannah Gutierrez Reed was convicted. Because the detective was in court, he decided to take it over to the sheriff's office. We were watching body cam video of him dropping it off. His name is Troy Teske. He is a retired police officer and, again, friend of the armorer's father. He said that these rounds may be tied to the death of Helena Hutchins. It did not come from the set of rust, but may have been mingled in and may have some connection to live rounds from a possible other uh, movie training that her father had had. So we just learned from that lead detective that it was her, her sheriff's supervisors, and the prosecutor, Carrie Morrissey, who instructed them to put that evidence under a different case number. And that is why the Baldwin defense team is asking for this case to be dismissed. Tom? So the, su the suggestion then, Dana, if I'm not mistaken, the suggestion would be that these rounds could have initially been a part of the same rounds that actually were involved in the murder, or, or, or are they grasping at straws here? Well, the, state's, the state says that this is a wild goose, ca goose chase. These rounds are not connected to the rounds that were covered from the movie recovered from the film set of Rust yeah. because they are different colored primers than the live rounds that were found, but they look similar to the dummy rounds. So if these rounds that were brought in happened to be co-mingled and they were, and, and someone thought that they were dummies, it could very well have been mixed in. And that's why we are where we are today, because the judge is trying to get to the bottom of where these rounds came from and was it relevant to this case and should the defense have gotten notice about it and if they weren't it is grounds to have this case potentially dismissed tom all right dana boy you've you've got us all hanging on your every word thank you very much <laughs> let's go to danny savalos yeah. right now our legal analyst all right buddy you're a defense attorney if alec baldwin was your client what would you be expecting right now and i gotta say i'm a little confused by the whole this round that round where where these bullets came from argument I can make it a lot easier for you. The prosecution may ultimately be right that these rounds were brought in by a friend of the armorer's father. And the prosecution's theory is basically that, hey, he brought these in to muddy the waters, and it really is a wild goose chase. And they may be right about that. But here's the important thing. It's not the prosecutor's call whether evidence is a wild goose chase or it's relevant to the case. Our system places a great deal of trust in prosecutors because they have that first look at the evidence and they decide what to disclose and what not to disclose. We trust them with this. And so just because the prosecution thinks, hey, we this is no big deal, it's a wild goose chase, that doesn't mean they didn't have an obligation to disclose it. And that's what the judge is deciding. That's why she's asking about what did the prosecutor do here? What was her choice? What was her call? Did she choose to suppress this evidence? And if so, the judge just might throw this case right out. Uh, you know, I'm a lay person, Danny, but to me, this has felt like a weak case uh, because you're arguing that uh, an actor who thought he was handling a cold gun with dummy blanks, whether he did or didn't knowingly pull the trigger, that he acted with malice when his job is to handle that weapon, right? I mean, it just feels a little bit like a reach, but maybe I'm misreading it. Tom, I'm a lay attorney, but let me tell you, I have said from the beginning, this is a weak prosecution case. And every day, we're in day three of the prosecution's case. At this point in the trial, it should feel like if you're on the defense, oh boy, this is a strong case because it's the prosecution's show. They have to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And yet we're three days into testimony and it feels like it's been nothing but wins for the defense. Even before the jury was picked, this case was on the ropes yeah. due to the defense's pretrial motions. Here we are on day three of testimony and the case may actually get tossed 
during the prosecution's case in chief, Tom, you are not wrong. Your assessment is spot on. It's the same as mine. This has always been a weak case, and it's gotten only weaker in the midst of trial. Danny, thank you. We'll check back. Coming up, the fire that forced passengers to evacuate an American Airlines plane this afternoon. Plus, how Oregon hospitals say hundreds of patients could have been exposed to hepatitis and HIV. We're coming back. We're back, bottom of the hour, we have some breaking news. An American Airlines flight forced to evacuate on the ground after a fire broke out inside the plane. Again, it was on the ground at San Francisco International Airport. Fire Rescue says the fire was put out and there were three very minor injuries. Nobody transported to the hospital. The flight was bound originally for Miami. Let's go to NBC's Jesse Kirsch with more on this. Uh, everybody's nightmare. You don't want to ever have a fire on a plane, right, Jesse? No, absolutely not, Tom. So what we're hearing from officials at the airport is that there was smoke detected in the cabin by the crew. And as you can imagine, that would trigger an emergency response. Like you said, three minor injuries, no medical transports were told. This was a departing flight from SFO. And this is uh, just further complicating the week for American Airlines. This is the second incident in three days that has gotten attention nationwide for this airline. On Wednesday, they had a flight that was taking off from Tampa, and that plane had an issue with its tires, according to the airline. There was video of that that appeared to show uh, smoke and, and uh, some brightness coming off of, of the back tire area on that flight on Wednesday. And again, uh, with this incident, no injuries have been reported, Tom, but we'll stay on top of it. Okay, Jesse, thank you very much. Good news. Nobody injured and the plane is safe. Uh, other breaking news. The jury just ending its first day of deliberations in the bribery case against New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez, and they will resume deliberations on Monday. Here he is walking out of court a few moments ago. The senator is facing 18 charges in all, along with two co-defendants. Prosecutors spent the last two months making their case that Senator Menendez accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars in gold bars and cash and cars from three New Jersey businessmen, all in exchange for political favors. And there are other really serious charges, including working as a foreign agent for the government of Egypt. Menendez's lawyers argue all of that cash and gold were not from bribes. He just has a habit of keeping the money and the gold bars in his house. NBC's Tom Winter is outside the courthouse in New York and has been following all of this for us. Tom, we're talking about a, a trial that has a lot of moving parts, a lot of charges, three defendants in all. How long could we be expecting this jury to deliberate? Well, the jury deliberated oh, just about three hours, Tom, and the senator, when he came out of that courthouse right here behind me just a few moments ago, you showed the video. He apparently told reporters that he, had faith, he has faith in God and in this jury. As far as this jury tackling the complex nature of this case, as you were alluding to, uh, it's something that's going to be interesting to follow here because... On one hand, there's a ton of evidence that they heard over, uh, or nearly, I should say, 30 government witnesses. They heard seven defense witnesses. They heard cross-examination. Cross they had closing arguments. They had rebuttals. And they had all sorts of detailed uh, analysis of that evidence, uh, including when the cash that was found in Menendez's home, when those bills would have rolled off the presses at Treasury in order to prove when that cash might have been obtained or when it might have been given to Menendez, according to federal prosecutors. So it's those type of details that ju the jury will consider. But when you look at the verdict form, if the jury believes that there was a bribery conspiracy here, if they establish that and there's a unanimity, unanimity among the jury along those lines, then the rest of the bribery count should fall pretty quickly. So it's possible by early next week we'll get a verdict here. And you'll be there. I know. Tom, thank you very much. Uh, let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. First up, one person is dead and two are missing after a tourist company's helicopter crashed off the Hawaiian island of Kauai. The FAA is investigating. Kauai authorities say they will provide an update later today. Last year, the FAA created a new process for air tour operators there after deadly crashes in recent years. 
Number two, just in the last couple of hours, we're learning Meta is going to lift restrictions on former President Trump's Facebook and Instagram accounts. You'll recall his accounts were suspended after January 6th when, and then reinstated in 2023. But with penalties now, Meta says that the party's conventions are coming up. It believes Americans should get to hear from the presidential nominees on some basis. Number three, health authorities in Oregon are telling more than 2,000 patients treated at two hospitals to get tested because they may have been exposed to HIV and hepatitis. Health workers say an anesthesiologist might not have followed infection control processes and the anesthesiologist has been terminated. Number four, it's bird versus drone. Angry birds on New York City beaches swarming the new drones that are out patrolling for any signs of sharks and also looking for swimmers in trouble. The Parks Department says the birds were, in their words, very annoyed at those drones. No birds have been injured so far, but we're told there have been some very close calls already. Number five, today the wedding of the year kicks off. Did you, did you get your invite? The youngest son of Mukesh Ambani, that's Asia's richest man, marries his longtime girlfriend. Celebrities and politicians arriving in Mumbai, India. There you go. You saw John Santa right there. Nick and there's Nick Jonas. Oh my goodness. For the start of four days of celebrations. Didn't get my invite. When we come back, how first responders rescued lost kayakers almost 24 hours after they were stuck. Plus, who's making a rare appearance at the RNC? Hint, a family member who's been out of view for a while. We've got a preview. Only a few days out of the GOP's big convention. We're coming back, and so are you. I told you you'd be back. NBC covers hundreds of stories each day, and because it's tough to read, to watch, or listen to everything, our teams, our bureaus have done it for you and for me. This is what they say is going down in their regions. We call it the local. From our Midwest Bureau, police are looking for two male suspects after an Ohio mother was killed trying to stop a carjacking. Her six-year-old son sleeping inside the car when it happened. Police say he's okay, and they're asking for anybody with any information to contact them. Out of our Northeast Bureau, a massive fire in Philadelphia destroyed an apartment building overnight. The fire department says it took 140 firefighters nearly three hours to get the blaze under control. Look at that. Nobody seriously injured, thankfully. The cause still under investigation. From our Midwest Bureau, uh, state police in Kentucky have rescued two missing kayakers after nearly 24 hours in the water. The pair apparently texted their family that they were lost. Crews then searched for hours until a helicopter pilot spotted them. Police say everybody is expected to be okay. Turning back now to politics with actor Matthew McConaughey saying late today he might still run for political office telling a room full of current governors he's still weighing whether he'll run for office, which office that would be, we simply don't know. And you may remember, the actor hinted back in 2022 that he might run for office in his home state of Texas. Let's bring in senior national politics reporter John Allen. All right, all right, all right. You knew I'd go there, right? <laughs> so uh, he may run for office, but he's not saying much more. So what are the options? And didn't I hear at some point he might run for governor? But you know this stuff better than I do. Well, that's right. Back in 2022, he was thinking about running for governor. Look, he lives in Austin. Uh, you know, he could run for everything from uh, Travis County office all the way up to governor or president of the United States someday. And he's from Uvalde, by the way. He's from Uvalde. Uh, and you remember after that shooting, yeah. uh, he was brought into the White House briefing room uh, where he gave a very impassioned, fiery, uh, speech. You, know, you could see some of those uh, skills that he might be able to bring to a political campaign. And, you know, I mean, look, look at him. He's still looking pretty good. I, the thing I like about him is I keep getting older and he looks like he's still I the know. same I don't age. Know what, I don't know what kind of <laughs> lamb's blood he's drinking, but he looks great. Um, so, you know, it could, could be anything, but uh, he What's obviously wants to be involved. What's your guess? My guess is he doesn't end up running for anything at all. Well, but it doesn't pay as much as he's making now. Right. It pays a lot less. And, and, and by the way, it requires a lot. A lot of frustrating, uh, you know, efforts to get things done. Yeah. It requires a lot of deep dives into policy, um, you know. And so maybe he ends up doing it. Uh, certainly, we are in a culture right now that rewards celebrity. Uh, well, that's true. Uh, but it also might require compromise. And, well, do we do that anymore? Compromise and humility. 
Um, yeah. And I mean, meanwhile, he's going to make whatever, $50 million on the next movie. I mean, you could see him in a drum circle with, uh, you know, people of the other party, you know, sort of <laughs> knocking out the Tom Toms. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, you I think, think, so? I think I he's know. admitted to smoking weed in the past. So, you know, maybe maybe try to get a peace pipe involved or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what? Stay tuned. When do we find out? Uh, you know, it's on his timetable. He's not a candidate until he is, as he might say. Okay, got to go. John, thank you very much. Thanks, Appreciate John. it. All right, coming up from us, RFK Jr.'s third-party bid, now kind of sputtering what his wannabe spoiler campaign is looking like recently in our breakdown. Turning back to politics now with Republicans gearing up for their national convention kicking off in just a couple of days. Melania Trump, someone we haven't seen really at all so far this cycle, is now confirmed to attend that event in a rare public appearance. Who else could be there? Mr. Trump's future pick for VP, perhaps. With the former president late today indicating Marco Rubio, J.D. Vance, Doug Burgum, and Tim Scott are all on the list. And he's also comparing the selection process to his old reality show, The Apprentice. And an announcement could, could come at the RNC because Trump says he wants to announce next week. Let's bring in Von Hilliard for more on this. Von, we rarely see Melania Trump. What's the significance of the fact that she's showing up right now in support of her husband? Right, Tom. Donald Trump announced this third bid for the presidency all the way back in November of 2022. Melania Trump was not there that night at Mar-a-Lago when he had his big announcement rollout. And she has not appeared on the campaign trail a single day since. She did go vote with him in the Florida presidential primary earlier this year, but she never was at any one of the trial days that in which her husband was the defendant over the course of seven weeks in lower Manhattan. And she was not there the night of the debate two weeks ago in Atlanta. So if, in fact, she does, as we're told, she will in Milwaukee at, uh, appear at the Republican convention. This would be her first time alongside of her husband on the campaign trail. To note, it is not clear yet whether she will be speaking like she did back in the 2016 campaign. Okay, let's talk VP picks. Uh, what more do we know about whether uh, the former president, um, where he might go with this? He's hinting right now it could be, it may not be. Uh, what are you picking up? You're the guy who watches the tea leaves and reads them and whatever else you do with tea leaves. I don't know. And sometimes, you know, the leaves, they blow a little bit. And this is for Donald Trump. Two weeks ago, he said that he had the person made up in his mind. But then just today in a radio interview, he said that there are four or five people on his mind. He named four of those individuals, Tim Scott, Marco Rubio, J.D. Vance, Doug Burgum. And he suggested that he could make his mind up potentially even on Monday, the first day of the convention. So each of these individuals we expect to come uh, to the convention, but he could announce that running mate really at any moment that he so desires to do so, Tom. Uh, and he'll do it apprentice style, apparently. This will be uh, interesting. All right. Vaughn, thank you. Vaughn Hilliard watching Thanks, it all. Friend. You can catch our live coverage of the RNC on Monday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern right here on NBC News Now. The independent candidate Robert Kennedy Jr. is also heading to Wisconsin next week to stump for votes while the Republican convention is going on. This is we're learning that he reportedly sent a text message apologizing to a woman who accused him of groping her back in 1999. It's just the latest in a string of sort of bizarre stories about Kennedy that have surfaced during the campaign. NBC's Catherine Koteski reports now. Bobby, Bobby, a third party Bobby, campaign gaining Bobby, early traction, angling to play spoiler this election season, now hitting some major speed bumps. RFK is back in the news for reasons. Right. He wouldn't want to be. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. started his long shot presidential bid as a Democrat, now running as an independent. Every time you comply, you get weaker. Always controversial for his strong anti-vaccine stance and support of conspiracy theories. But an article published by Vanity Fair now adding to the list of bad press to combat with numerous allegations from his past. It features a photo of Kennedy with what writers identified as a dog carcass, leading to a whirlwind of coverage, forcing him to respond. Of course, it's not a dog. And they said I was eating a dog in Korea and that they had checked with experts, uh, metadata experts, and identified it as Korea and checked with veterinarians who 
who validated that it was a dog and it's a goat and it's in Patagonia. Daddy would never do something like that. Kennedy now seeming to take the story in stride. It was a goat. But it wasn't the only damning news from the article, which included a sexual assault allegation. The publication reporting that Kennedy groped a former babysitter of his children, Eliza Cooney, in 1999. Cooney told her mother in 2017 and spoke with a lawyer about potentially bringing a civil suit after Kennedy declared his candidacy last year, according to the report. You're talking there about the nanny situation. I mean, I, I, I do have to ask her. I mean, are you denying it or not? I'm not going to comment on it. First reported by the Washington Post, but confirmed by NBC News, RFK Jr. reached out to Cooney in a text message two days after the Vanity Fair story, saying that he does not remember the alleged incident and apologizing for, quote, anything I ever did that made you feel uncomfortable. When the Washington Post reached out to Kennedy for a response, he said, quote, the text message speaks for itself. NBC News reached out to the campaign for comment, but did not hear back and has no record of a civil suit ever being filed. The Vanity Fair bombshells dropping while the RFK Jr. campaign was already at a low point, failing to qualify for the first presidential debate hosted by CNN in June. Kennedy not getting a bump in the polls despite President Joe Biden's struggles. Perhaps surprising. After a quick start. As both major parties concerned he could shake up the race. But as early excitement gained momentum, so did anger from some family members. I am excited to vote for Joe Biden. Siblings and cousins trying to protect the Kennedy name, calling out the use of his uncle's jingle and likeness in a Super Bowl ad. And backing President Biden at the White House in March. You know, the truth is, is that I love my brother and it pains me to come out against him. But I am very concerned with the stakes in this election. Then reports of a previous health scare first reported in May by The New York Times. Kennedy said doctors discovered he had a dead worm in his brain after experiencing memory loss and mental fogginess in 2010. The news flying in the face of his uber fit image, trying to contrast himself with the older Trump and Biden. Kennedy is 70 years old. Now, running into technical hurdles and a cash shortfall as well. He is currently only on the ballot in 11 states, and according to the latest FEC filing from May, the campaign spent more money than raised. Thank you so much for being here today. His running mate, Nicole Shanahan, now keeping the campaign afloat. A former lawyer, entrepreneur, and ex-wife of Google founder Sergey Brin donating millions to fund the long shot bid as she keeps a low profile on the trail. But in a tight race between two major parties, even a relatively small showing for RFK Jr. could swing the election. The Democrats are frightened that I'm going to spoil the election for President Biden. Republicans are frightened that I'm going to spoil it for President Trump. The truth is they're both right. My intention is to spoil it for both of them. And NBC's Catherine Koretsky uh, joins me now. Catherine, uh, RFK Jr. heads to Wisconsin next week where the Republican National Convention is taking place. So what are his plans? Yeah, Tom, exactly right. So RFK Jr. headed to Wisconsin, the crucial swing state as we look ahead to November where the RNC is taking place, like you mentioned. His campaign telling me this morning that he does plan on hosting a few events. Um, he's also going to be there in front of the media where the people are. He's going to be able to talk to voters um, on Wednesday in an event focusing on farming um, as well as a few other events that have yet to be announced. But, you know, a, a big state uh, headed into November, the RNC coming up, according to an AARP poll, uh, taken after the June 27th debate, former President Trump up slightly ahead of President Biden and RFK Jr. keeping that 9% uh, high single digit percentage, which is um, common across many polls for him. So could be a factor in this election, especially in Wisconsin. It's going to be a busy couple of days and a busy week on the campaign trail for uh, Catherine, all of these I've got, Tom. I've got 10 seconds. Who is he pulling that support from? 9%. Who is he pulling it from? Trump supporters or Biden supporters? Yeah, so a poll uh, that was taken a few months ago said it was Trump. But as we get closer to November, the debate was obviously a big factor. So we'll see as time goes on. But um, okay. right now, it's former President Trump. All right, Catherine, thank you very much. Still to come from us, how demolishing dams is literally changing the landscape, bringing new life to the Pacific Northwest. That's coming up in our original. And it's a cool story, so stick around. Back now with tonight's original in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's the largest dam removal project ever in the U.S. 
Crews are taking down four dams built around 100 years ago that split up a river that ran from Oregon all the way to California. Here's the problem. The dams decimated salmon populations and toxic algae bloomed. Now the locals are hoping for a fresh start. Here's NBC's Steve Patterson. A demolition of dams. Unearthing a hundred year history of toxic algae, thousands of dead salmon, and new concerns over how to fight wildfires, all part of the long battle to bring nature back to the Pacific Northwest. Restoration of over 2,000 acres of land. California is saying it's the largest river restoration project in American history. Now, a rebirth is finally taking shape. It represents a future for our people, for kids and grandkids and generations to come. The lifeblood that once empowered the beautiful banks of the renowned Klamath River was all but lost for more than 100 years, slowly but surely flowing again. There was a time when I didn't think I'd see this day. Leif Hillman is a member of the Karak tribe, who for generations has been fighting for something many say is vital, removing a damaging blockade of dams. I've spent the better part of my adult life um, working to remove dams on the Klamath River. According to Noah, for thousands of years, this was one of the largest salmon producing rivers on the West Coast, fueling several economies of indigenous communities. But at the turn of the 20th century, a private power company with federal permission installed four monstrous dams, fracturing the iconic waterway spanning from Oregon through California. The dams initially powered surrounding communities, including burgeoning lumber mills, but have since become obsolete aging structures. And in the stagnant water reservoirs created by the dams, bloom toxic algae. We were the first to discover this toxic algae. The salmon were decimated. The nonprofit in charge of the project, the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, estimates more than 90% of the native salmon species has been lost since the dams were installed. In 2002, 34 to 70,000 fish were killed almost all at once. The toxic algae was in the reservoirs. So if these dams were kept in place, the fish had a real uh, likelihood of going extinct in this watershed. Dam removal in the U.S. is at an all-time high. Over 2,100 dams have been removed since 1912, with nearly half happening in the last decade. River people stand tall. The dams are going to fall. Tribal elders, scholars, and young activists uniting in protest for decades. But there are some pain points. With wildfire season ongoing, losing reservoirs created by the dams impacts the way wildfires are fought in the region. Klamath River Renewal Corporation CEO Mark Bransom has dedicated years to finding some creative solutions, like helping to build a network of remote sensing cameras and better access points. So they have the ability to dip water from the river or to drive right down to the river's edge to fill water trucks, and that will really help replace the loss of the reservoirs as a wildfire fighting water source. The Yurok tribe is also hand planting 8.5 tons of native seeds and plans to keep going for the next three years, all while the fish are expected to usher in a new generation. This year, we'll start to see adult Chinook and Coho moving upstream, but it'll really be two to three generations before we see sustainable populations being established in those tributaries. My kids will be telling a different story. It's not going to be a story of continued decline. It's going to be a story of actually recovery and regaining the abundance that we once enjoyed. A renaissance of water, returning the river's sacred right back to an uninhibited freedom. NBC Steve Patterson joins me now. Steve, first of all, great job. What a great story and so important. So when will the dam removal uh, be expected to be finished? So the CEO of the project says that this should all be done. And when he means all be done, he means all be done by October. The dam completely removed. There shouldn't be a sign of a speck of any equipment or even a piece of dirt that you saw there behind them. This should be a completely free flowing river like it was for hundreds of years come October or November. Now, what does that mean for necessarily the wildlife coming back? That's sort of a different answer. It could take generations 
generations for like the salmon to repopulate, for the vegetation to grow back after all the work they've done planting it. That's got, not going to be us. That's not going to be our children. It may be our children's children before we see the results. But the groundwork being laid and this taking down the dams, such an essential part of it. Tom? Steve, you know, you've got the corner on the wildlife stories and the and the cool, yeah. cool spots out of the Pacific Northwest. I, good job. Keep going. It's a good, good storytelling and we need it. All right, buddy. All right. I'm lucky. Uh, well, yes, you are. Uh, you're also good. That's a wrap for this hour. Coverage resumes right now on News Now. Top of the hour, you're not going anywhere. We come on the air with President Biden getting ready for yet another test of his candidacy. He's holding a rally in Michigan as more Democrats and donors push him to drop out. We'll look at whether there's any way for him to change their minds and his mind. Plus, pretty much all of the customers on one of the country's biggest cell phone companies are victims of a hack. Their cell and text records stolen. We're going to tell you what's, what was taken in this massive breach and how you can make sure that your data is safe. And this heat wave, this relentless heat wave and the blackout have already turned deadly in Houston. We're live on the ground as thousands may not have their power back for days, for days. Then high drama today at the Alec Baldwin trial. Boy, this is confusing. The claim his lawyers are making that could get the case thrown out. We'll tell you how it all played out in front of the cameras today. Plus, passengers forced to get off their American Airlines flight in San Francisco. The video just in from inside the plane coming up later in the show. Thankfully, everybody's okay. The fire department on the scene. Good day. I'm Tom Costello in for Halley. And tonight we start with President Biden still holding on, telling supporters in Michigan in just the last hour that he is still the man for the job, despite more Democrats, more Democrats turning on him. One Democratic lawmaker telling him to his face he should step aside. That, according to several people that NBC News talked to, and also more donors are turning away. Any minute, we're going to see President Biden on the campaign trail in Michigan. At the podium, you're looking at live right now, the introductions beginning in yet another test of his candidacy. As we're just hearing reports, some of the biggest Democratic donors in the country, mega donors, are withholding a whopping 90 million dollars in funds as long as he, President Biden, stays in the race. That according to sources who talked to the New York Times. But President Biden remains defiant, defending his fitness for office in that big news conference just 24 hours ago. And listen, people are watching. New numbers from Nielsen show 25 million people, 25 million, tuned into that press conference. The third most watched non-sports event of the year. The president sticking to his script here that he is not going anywhere unless his team came to him and said there's no way he would win. Now, some of his campaign staff are telling our team exactly that, but it's, it's not clear if they're taking that message to the president. And the view on Capitol Hill, more uncertainty, with the president joining calls with members of key congressional caucuses. With a big question still. Could the president possibly stop the political bleeding? Because take a look at the screen here. More and more Democrats are coming out, even in just the last few hours, calling on Mr. Biden to drop out. So our team is talking to voters on the ground, former Biden voters who like him and want him to step aside. Take a listen. I love that man. He's done more for black people than any president I know. I think it's time for him to step down. I was a Biden supporter right up until the debate. Uh, now I really would like to see an open convention. All right, we've got team coverage. NBC's Julie Serkin is posted up on Capitol Hill right across the street. But we begin with Monica Alba down the street. She's at the White House. And Monica, there's quite a split screen here between the turmoil in D.C., and this optimism the president is trying to strike on the campaign trail, right? Exactly, Tom. And it was the president himself who said earlier this week that he likes to dismiss the pundits, the elites, as he likes to call them, and that what he really wants to do during this critical time while his campaign is struggling and in crisis, frankly, is to get out and meet with real voters and Americans who will be making this difficult decision about whether to vote for him or sit at home potentially in November if he is still the Democratic nominee. And what he effectively is trying to argue here is that when he goes 
to places like Wisconsin, like Pennsylvania, like Michigan today. When he talks to voters, he says he still feels like they want him to continue in this race. And that's clearly what he believes at this moment in time. And that's what he's going to pursue. But it isn't enough. It is really not enough to quiet some of these concerns and anxieties that you're hearing directly from Democratic lawmakers and from even the external pressure and the outside of the bubble apparatus in Washington of people who have worked either with him for a long time or who are a part of the Obama administration who are really just raising what many voters in some polling are reflecting, which is that they do have concerns about his path forward and his ability to remain at the top of the ticket. But he's going to have a very busy couple of days trying to make this case. He's going to be heading to Texas and then on to Nevada Monday and Tuesday. And we should also point out he has an important interview with our own colleague Lester Holt scheduled for Monday as well, Tom. You know, I, I got to say, I just reread this number because it really struck me. 25 million people tuned into the press conference yesterday. That is the third biggest uh, event, the third most watched non-sport event of the year. I mean, a lot of people saw him do certainly better than he did on the first debate. Uh, so there's that, right? And then secondly, $90 million being withheld. That's a lot of money. Uh, and that hurts the campaign, right? With big donors saying they're not going to pony up that $90 million until he steps out. Yeah, that's right, Tom. And that specific 90 million figure is related to what's known as a super PAC. So it's an outside group separate from the actual Biden campaign or the Democratic National Committee and their affiliated entities that raise money. Now, those groups are saying that grassroots support is strong, that they actually saw an increase in donations from people who are chipping in five dollars, ten dollars, fifteen dollars during the president's press conference last night. So they're trying to say that that kind of donation and fundraising momentum is going OK, but it is definitely the big ticket donors that have tremendous concerns and have been raising them yeah. ever since his poor debate performance. So I do think that that is a big concern. And yes, you are right to highlight all of those eyeballs. The fact that that many million people watched, it was also really, frankly, a matter of it slid back so much that it ended up yeah. being in prime time when it wasn't originally de designed that way. So I think even more people saw it because of that, Tom. Yep. Uh, very interesting. Uh, all right. People close to the president. Uh, let's assume that somebody convinces him to step aside. Yes, it's his decision. But the process for potentially Kamala Harris to become the nominee. Yeah, I understand the money would shift right to her. The money that is raised for him would shift to her. But logistically, is it possible that she could get on the ballots in individual states? Well, and that's why the timing is so critical here, because we're talking about the Democratic National Convention when there would be the formal process that would take place should this happen, should something shift. We know that that is deeper into August, but there was supposed to be an even virtual roll call deadline ahead of that. So then we're talking more about early August. So we're really shrinking that down to just these critical next few weeks if there was going to be some change. But it is easier because Kamala Harris is already on the ticket as a vice president to transfer the entity, the apparatus, the campaign infrastructure and the money to her should that happen. But again, the president and his senior aides are saying right now there are absolutely no plans for that, though the president conceded last night that should that be necessary, of course, that's why he picked her to be his running mate. And he has confidence that she could serve if that's necessary. OK, Monica, thank you very much. Let's go to Julie Serkin right now with a view from Capitol Hill. And Julie, we we know Nancy Pelosi told members to wait until after NATO to express their concerns about the president. NATO is over. They're leaving town. What now? Well, what now, Tom, is that five additional members since the conclusion of that press conference, since Biden finished his visits with those NATO, NATO leaders, have come out since and has have called on Biden to step aside to exit the race, three of them coming today, uh, two of them, excuse me, the latest being Mike Levin, who actually, before he put out a statement calling on Biden to pass the torch, sources told us that on a Congressional Hispanic Caucus call with the president, Levin directly confronted Biden, telling him, we've appreciated what you've done. I 
I respect you. I respect your uh, four years as president in the White House. It is time to pass the torch to somebody who can beat Donald Trump okay. in November. That is significant, of course. Biden replied, according to our sources, telling him, this is why I'm having these calls with all of you, so you can ask me these tough questions so I can be put on the spot in front of all of these members. He held that call, Biden did, with members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, later talking to members of the Asian Pacific American Caucus. Tomorrow, Tom, he has other calls scheduled, according to sources we spoke to, including the Progressive Caucus. Pramila Jayapal, who chairs that panel, told me earlier this week that she has a lot of questions for the president. She certainly wants to hear from him directly so that she can make sure that her concerns, her members' concerns, are answered as well. And the new Democrats uh, also scheduled to have a call with President Biden. This is a group of frontliners, members that represent vulnerable swing districts. These are people who, of course, have been especially nervous because Biden being at the top of the ticket indicates that perhaps they could suffer when it comes to November and it's time for voters to vote and, and check those boxes all the way down the Democratic ticket. So a really pivotal couple of days. I know we keep saying this, Tom, but certainly now that NATO has left town, as Pelosi has certainly in her legacy here, she has refrained from um, criticizing anyone, even Donald Trump, when it comes to presidents meeting with foreign leaders. So this is really typical for her. But you saw what Clyburn, another prominent Democrat, said today about Biden sort of leaving the door open for a potential change on the ticket down the line. So far, though, as you heard yep. from Monica, Biden vowing to stay in, Tom. Julie, thank you. we got to move on. We've got breaking news just coming in right now. Just learning now that the case against Alec Baldwin in the Rust shooting trial has been dismissed. We bring in our NBC Dana Griffin reporter and legal analyst Kristen gibbons Fedden is also with us. Uh, Dana, what a shocker, right? Give us the, the, the highs and lows. What just happened? My goodness. I mean, I've never witnessed something like this happen. But essentially, the judge agreed with Baldwin's defense that the evidence that could have helped their case was held against them, essentially prosecutorial misconduct. They said that evidence was withheld. These rounds that were brought into the sheriff's office back during Hannah Gutierrez Reed's trial, but was never disclosed to the defense. So they brought this up during their arguments because they had a motions hearing. Carrie Morrissey, the prosecutor in this case, took the stand in her own defense, so to speak. And that's when we learned her co-counsel, Orlinda Johnson, resigned today. And the lead detective on the case is the one who said that it was her, her sheriff supervisor, and prosecutor Carrie Morrissey that decided to put this evidence under a different case number, which ultimately let it sort of disappear. And so just in the courtroom, we saw the judge read out that this conduct was highly prejudiced to the defense and you saw actor Alec Baldwin break down into tears as the judge granted their motion to dismiss his family emotional he stood up left the courtroom uh, we are working to get more details about what's happening now outside of that courtroom but obviously a major shocker in this case and also it's important to remember what is the family of Helena Hutchins thinking at this moment. They were looking for justice in this case, and they said that they were, you know, hoping that anyone held accountable would be brought, you know, would be judged by a peer, their peers in a jury. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a tough day for the family who's looking for answers, but for the Baldwin defense, a major win in this case. Tom? Uh, Dana, thank you. Uh, Kristen, is this a surprise to you as an attorney and a former prosecutor? I mean, I got to say, I'm a layperson watching from the other side of the country, and this prosecutor's case all along has seemed troubled. Yeah, Tom, like you pointed out, from start to finish. And really, unfortunately, the finish is very serious. This is what's called under the law a Brady violation. As, as Dana pointed out, the prosecution failed to disclose that ammunition. That was critical evidence, but most importantly, evidence that if tested by the defense could have been favorable to their defense. And the fact that it was put under a different case number really highlights that level of misconduct that could have been, um, well, actually, that the judge actually found. So this dismissal request, I mean, the judge could have done many things. They could have sanctioned. They could have given defense more time to test that evidence. But the judge found this display of withholding this evidence, putting it under a different case name so that it looked like it wasn't part of this case to be so egregious that the judge actually invoked the most serious sanction that happens in these types of cases when there is a Brady violation. And that's the yeah. dismissal of the case yeah. entirely. 
don't go anywhere, Kristen. Dana, we've got video just into us right now of Baldwin's reaction okay. in court as he broke down crying when the judge dismissed the yeah. case. Uh, and so Alec Baldwin will leave New Mexico uh, a free man, uh, not facing any more charges related to the death of, um, of the director of the movie that he was producing. And I'm just wondering, as you look at the, those are pretty authentic emotions coming from him. This has been an extraordinarily stressful time for him, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's super stressed. And you can only imagine, because remember, if we walk through the history of this case, he was charged with involuntary manslaughter. The charges were dropped at one point. Yeah. The former special prosecutor had... Uh, attached this special enhancement that would have possibly landed him five years in prison, but it was the wrong charge to attach because that law was enacted after the shooting. And then January of this year, a grand jury indicts him on the same charges. He has fought time and time again to try to get this case dismissed. They have alleged prosecutorial misconduct for several other issues. So to get to this trial and to have this major bombshell be revealed, not only does it impact Baldwin's case, but you best believe the defense attorney for the armorer, Hannah Gutierrez Reed, will likely try to request her case be overturned. What if she, she may now be released from prison because that the evidence of these rounds was really more helpful or possibly exculpatory to her case because she alleged that these that she didn't know that where those live rounds came from and that this box either she didn't know where it came from or that she got it from the supplier. So we may likely have to re, the judge may likely have to review not only her case. Um, sir, will review the evidence that was presented in this case, but also her case. So this yeah. this legal fight is not over, Tom. Dana, uh, real quickly, uh, let's pause because we've just now got the sound in. This is the judge issuing the order when she dismissed the case against Baldwin. Let's play that. The sanction of dismissal is the only warranted remedy. The jury has been sworn, jeopardy has attached, and a mistrial would not be based upon manifest necessity. Further, the sanction of dismissal is warranted in this case. The state has repeatedly made representations to defense and to the court that they were compliant with all their discovery obligations. Despite their repeated representations, they have continued to fail to disclose critical evidence to the defendant. Brady and Harper are satisfied. Dismissal with prejudice is warranted. Kristen, you've been in many uh, trials yourself as a former prosecutor. Uh, I'm just wondering, did, did, did this whole prosecution seem weak and fumbled to you? And then what kind of a black eye is it to have the whole case dismissed by the judge? It's not only a black eye, Tom, to have the whole case dismissed by the judge, but I think where the black eye really truly comes in is the judge made very clear this is prosecutorial misconduct. And why is it prosecutorial misconduct? The very last thing any prosecutor ever wants to be accused of is a Brady violation. And that means that you did not turn over critical evidence to the defense. And based on the way that the judge stated it, it really implies or really explicitly states that it was intentionally withheld. Sometimes Brady violations are by, my, by mistake, and so the case can come back down. But the judge said they, the case cannot even be retrialed. She cannot do a mistrial. Jeopardy is already attached, and that's why she had to dismiss it with prejudice. So they cannot retry uh, Alec Baldwin. They can't give the evidence back to him, give him more time, and then reinstitute the charges. This case is yeah. over, so it is yeah. a huge black eye. So what does this mean, then, for the prosecutors who brought the case? If they've been accused of prosecutory mis misconduct, uh, might they face charges, or what could be the ramifications for them? I don't think they would face any criminal charges, Tom, but certainly they could face some type of ethical violations. Um, with Brady, typically what happens is the court kind of looks at why was the evidence withheld. In this case, Tom, I don't understand why there would be any reason why the critical evidence in this case would be assigned to a different case number. That case number that is attached to the file is so important because it allows you to kind of organize all of the case documents as well as the evidence. And all prosecutors know that from pro everyone in the prosecutorial office knows that from prosecutor, attorney, all the way to, you know, office clerk. And so it really doesn't 
it really defies logic as to why she would do that other than to point to intentional trying to uh, withhold this evidence. And as Dana pointed out, it's going to also call into question the integrity of the other trial. The headline, the breaking news, uh, Alec Baldwin, his case dismissed because of prosecutorial misconduct in New Mexico. He is a free man. Kristen and Dana, thank you both very much. Uh, the other major, we've got a lot of major stories happening, but down south, 14 people have now died from heat-related causes in Texas and Louisiana as that sweltering heat sweeps across the American South and the West. Among those, possibly a 93-year-old woman in Houston who passed away in an elderly care facility in the midst of that double whammy heat wave and blackout in Houston. The medical system there, as we've said, pushed to the breaking point with at least a dozen hospitals still on backup generators. And that's what happens when you're on backup generators. 875,000 people in Houston still without power as of this morning. Houston's electricity provider hopes to get power restored to 80% by Sunday night. People are going to social media to share their experiences. Take a listen. Luckily, we were able to find some ice, so we got some cold drinks at least. And really the only <clears throat> relief we've found is putting like towels in the ice water and just putting them around our necks or our backs. Yeah, it's brutal. It's not just Houston. The entire West Coast is, is melting. Triple digit temperatures across that region. And we've got team coverage still on the story. Correspondent Priscilla Thompson and meteorologist Bill Karen standing by to cover all of this. Priscilla, let's start with you. Uh, the heat there, extreme. And for folks who have no place to go, this could really be life or death, right? And you and I were talking an hour ago, particularly at risk, the, the elderly and the poor. And boy, have you heard really terrible stories. Yeah, Tom, we've been out at these distribution sites and cooling centers speaking to people, and it's all of the things that you just mentioned. I spoke to a woman in her 50s uh, the other day who had diabetes and was saying that she's literally coming to the cooling center and going home and alternating, trying to manage her underlying conditions while also trying to stay cool. And it is similar stories in these distribution lines today. Uh, we spoke to one woman who, thankfully, her power was restored today, but she was talking about what it's been like over the past several days that she's had to deal with this and I want to play some of that conversation. How many people in your household? Uh, six. Six, okay. And how much food would you say you've had to throw away? Hundreds. Like, Hundreds of dollars worth? Yeah. It's been a lot of food and a lot of different like especially like taking a bath and all that stuff. We can't do any of that stuff. We just had cold water. And that's one of the things for some folks who didn't sustain any damage from this actual storm to their homes and may have thought they were in the clear financially, but are now having to throw away hundreds of dollars of food. Some people having to find like hotels and places where they can stay because it is simply too hot inside of these homes. I've had people describe it as like being in an oven. They say if it feels like triple digits outside, it's probably feels like double that inside of their homes. And so just some of what we're hearing about what this heat uh, feels like right now, Tom. Uh, I talk about the, the woman that you know uh, who died there, right, the 93-year-old the and, and the efforts to provide relief for, for others who may be in a similar situation. Yeah, so Barbara Sturgis was her name. She was living in an independent um, living facility. That facility was without power. They had been using a backup generator to cool off some of the common areas. Um, and her son is the person who said that, you know, when he went there on Tuesday, he saw that the generator was working. It was fairly cool in there, but that he got a call Thursday morning that his mother had died. And when he went in on Thursday, he said that it was much hotter in there than it had been when he was there even a few days earlier. So no official word confirming that her death was heat related, but her family certainly feels like that may have been a factor. And as you mentioned, there were 14 people across Texas and Louisiana that were killed in this storm. And at least four of those deaths have been confirmed related to heat. So it's definitely a major issue heading into the weekend. People, you know, officials don't want to see any more people die as a result of this heat and lack of power uh, in addition to the impacts of the storm. Tom? Yeah, another, another long weekend. Uh, Priscilla, thank you very much. Uh, it's still not just Texas scorching in that summer sun. The whole region is, is really hot. Well, let's go to meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, how long are people, I know I, we ask you this all the time, but <laughs> you can understand people tune in and they want the latest. How long are people going to be dealing with this heat? When will we get relief? 
All right, so the West Coast, Tom, is actually going to improve as we go through the weekend. But the middle of the country and then the East Coast, the heat wave comes roaring back. And in some cases, it'll be worse than what we just experienced this past week. I mean, now we're smack in the middle of what we usually call the hottest time of year in the United States. That's usually like as we get to the second and third weeks of July. So it's not a big surprise, but it's just, it's just endless. We just need a break every now and then. So now we're up to 66 million. We just added everyone here in the middle of the country. And also we added the Philadelphia area. Houston's still under a heat advisory, by the way. Over the weekend, Houston's expecting 94 degrees both days. The heat index will get up there right around 104 to 106. So still very, very unpleasant if you're anywhere without air conditioning. Denver's still sitting at 101. We noticed Salt Lake City jumped up. They're only one degree away from your record high. Vegas has tied the record high for the day. Phoenix, you're one degree away. So we're still a little early, mid, or you say middle of the afternoon. We're going to add a couple degrees to these. So we are going to break more records in the West, just like we've been doing all along. And as we look at Tomorrow, we continue very warm. I mentioned it starts to spread another. Can you believe it? We're going to end up with three 100-degree days in a row in Denver. That's almost unheard of. Uh, Wichita will be 100, and then the heat and humidity is back up and down the East Coast. Nashville near 100 Monday, Tuesday. D.C. Monday, Tuesday should be right around 100, if not above 100. And it's going to be humid on the East Coast, too, Tom. So not enjoyable. And uh, make sure that A.C. is fine-tuned. Change that filter, too, because you don't want it failing next week. Yeah. Hey, is Canada open? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, okay. For me, I don't know about you. I don't know what trouble you've been in, but. <laughs> All right. Bill, thank you very much. Tonight, the FBI is investigating a massive AT&T breach that has compromised millions of American cell phone calls and texts. AT&T says hackers stole six months worth of call and text message records earlier this year from nearly all of its cellular customers, more than 100 million people. Take a look at the dates here. The company says hackers stole records related to May 1st to Halloween 2022, then again January 2nd of 23. The content of the calls and the messages not compromised, but the records include phone numbers and cyber pros say it's relatively easy for hackers to match those numbers with personal information already on the dark web and determine who's calling whom and texting whom. NBC's Brian Chung joins us now. I talked to uh, several cyber pros today who say this data could compromise private information about who you're calling, texting, confidential police informants, medical information, national security sources. Really, it could be invaluable to a foreign country or even organized crime. Yeah, and what makes all this even more alarming is the breadth of how many people are affected by this. So by some estimates, it's over 109 million people because this affects virtually every phone call and text message that was done on AT&T over that six-month period in 2022. And naturally, a lot of people are going to be asking the question, well, why is it that we're only hearing about this now in 2024? Well, on one hand, uh, AT&T says that it itself was only aware of this uh, breach as of April of this year. And then between April and now it had essentially been working with the Department of Justice and the FBI to try to find those behind this particular data breach before disclosing it publicly. And the AT&T did say that they have apprehended at least one person. But I want to emphasize the data contains phone numbers. So if you and I texted each other during that period in 2022, they would have the phone numbers associated with those interactions, but they would not have yeah. the content of those calls or texts. That's a very important distinction, Tom. Absolutely. But for example, if I'm a journalist and you're a whistleblower and uh, you and I are texting back and forth. It's a big deal. The concern is that information will be valuable to whoever the whistleblower is kind of re is, is talking about, right? Whether it's a company, whether it's a government agency, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And really serious stuff there, which is why it's kind of a, a, a secondary uh, reaction here over how this was able to ha how was how this was happening to such a large company. And, you know, I know that you spoke with someone over at CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, that has said this really underscores the need to strengthen the infrastructure within uh, these private carriers in terms of defending themselves from a yeah. breach like this. They say that they're trying to take cybersecurity measures on AT&T's end. They're going to contact customers and they are continuing to work with law enforcement of, uh, officials at the FBI and the DOJ to try to get their heads around this, Tom. Yeah, the U.S. cybersecurity chief told me, listen, we got to start treating these telecom companies like they are critical infrastructure companies. They need to have even better and more robust defenses. Brian, Absolutely. always on the story. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. Coming up from us, new warnings tonight in Italy after an American died while hiking up Mount Etna. What rescuers say is dangerous for tourists there. Plus, the royal family member making a return to public duties after a health scare. We're coming back.
Back now with breaking news, uh, a look at brand new footage of this uh, coming into us now, a look inside the cabin of an American Airlines flight that was forced to evacuate after a small fire broke out inside the plane while it was on the ground at San Francisco International Airport. You can see the chaos there on the smoke. Patients make that parents clutching their children, people climbing over the chairs trying to get out of the cabin. Thankfully, fire rescue teams say the fire was out pretty quickly. There were only three very minor injuries. The flight was bound for Miami. Let's go to NBC's Jesse Kirsch with more. Do we know yet what was the cause of this fire, Jesse? We don't have a cause yet, Tom, but we do have a new statement from the FAA, and I think that in conjunction with those images you just showed uh, just puts into focus uh, what was... I'm sure, a frightening scene for those families. Uh, the FAA says that the passengers exited this Airbus A321 using emergency slides. And as you pointed out, Tom, there appear to be children on this plane. So uh, that is how we're told that these passengers had to evacuate from this plane. As you mentioned, three minor injuries reported during the evacuation, according to SFO. However, the airport says that no one needed medical transport. This is the second incident in a matter of three days involving uh, an American Airlines flight. On Wednesday, there was a plane that was getting ready to take off from Tampa and had an issue with a tire, according to the airline. There were no injuries reported from that incident. Uh, so again, Tom, we don't have word on what caused this yet, but we're told that crew members reported smoke in the cabin, and that is what prompted this evacuation scene, Tom. More when we have it. Yeah, and, and um, let's make the point. In the cabin, while the plane is on the ground, it's not an engine fire. Um, uh, there was some uh, some speculation that maybe a lithium battery issue, and we've had a lot of those lately, but no confirmation, right? Correct. At this point, I've not seen anything about a lithium battery. Uh, again, all we know is smoke in the cabin, that evacuation, three minor injuries, as you stressed. Uh, and yeah. again, no one was needed to be taken away in medical transport, from what we're told. Good news, Jesse. Thank you very much. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. First up, British police have now arrested a man suspected of killing three family members with a crossbow. Take a look at video captured by Sky News earlier this week of police outside the murder site and recall that the victims were the, boy, the wife and two adult children of a BBC commentator. They were found seriously injured at their home near London and pronounced dead at the scene a short time later. Police say the suspect is in serious condition at a local hospital. Number two, a judge has thrown out Rudy Giuliani's bankruptcy case, saying he was uncooperative and not transparent. Giuliani filed for bankruptcy in December after a court ordered him to pay millions to two Georgia election workers for defamation. This new decision allows the election workers and others to try to get the money he owes them. But Giuliani also now can appeal the defamation verdict. Number three, health authorities in Oregon are telling more than 2,000 patients treated at two hospitals to get tested because they may have been exposed to HIV and hepatitis. Health workers say an anesthesiologist might not have followed infection control practices. The anesthesiologist has been terminated. Number four, it's birds versus drones. It's not a video game. Angry birds on New York City beaches are swarming the new drones that are patrolling for any signs of sharks and also looking for swimmers who might be in trouble. The Parks Department says the birds don't like it. Uh, they're, and they're very annoyed, say the parks officials. No birds have been harmed so far, but we're told there have been some close calls between drones and birds. Number five, today the wedding of the year kicks off as the youngest son of Mukesh Abani, Asia's richest man, marries his longtime girlfriend. Celebrities and politicians arriving in Mumbai include John Cena there and the Jonas family, or at least Nick and his lovely wife, all for the start of four days of celebrations. And I could catch a really fast flight if I ever get the invite. I'm sure it's in the email. When we come back, new comments from Matthew McConaughey today saying he is not ruling out running for a political office. What office that might be coming up next. Plus, why authorities in Mexico say at least 200 crocodiles are crawling into cities. Mm, that's not good. We're coming back. We're back. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and it's tough to read, watch, or listen to everything. So our bureau teams have picked out a few highlights. Here's what they say they're watching. We call it the global. 
from Italy. Italy's Pro Alpine Rescue Service says an American tourist has died after falling ill during a hike on Mount Etna. An air ambulance apparently found him, a 55-year-old in a remote area. Rescue teams say they don't know the cause of illness yet, but they're warning tourists not to underestimate high temperatures and humidity there. In Mexico, heavy rains caused at least 200 crocodiles to crawl into cities near the border with Texas. Police captured and relocated dozens of them after the hurricane hit the area. Environmental officials say that water levels changing there will lead to even more crocodile sightings, but that means there are still dozens on the loose. From the United Kingdom, Princess Anne is making a gradual return to royal duties at a horse riding championship today. It comes less than three weeks after she was hospitalized with a concussion. You'll recall her medical team said her injuries were consistent with potential impact from a horse's head or legs. Turning back now to politics with Matthew McConaughey saying late today he might still run for political office, telling a room full of current governors he is still weighing whether he might run for office, which office that would be, we simply don't know yet. And you may remember the actor hinted back in 2022 he might run for office in his home state of Texas. So we bring in senior national politics reporter John Allen. All right, all right, all right. You knew I'd go there, right? <laughs> so uh, he may run for office, but he's not saying much more. So what are the options? And didn't I hear at some point he might run for governor? But you know this stuff better than I do. Well, that's right. Back in 2022, he was thinking about running for governor. Look, he lives in Austin. Uh, you know, he could run for everything from uh, Travis County office all the way up to governor or president of the United States someday. And he's from Uvalde, by the way. He's from Uvalde. Uh, and you remember after that shooting, yeah. uh, he was brought into the White House briefing room uh, where he gave a very impassioned, fiery uh, speech. You, know, you could see some of those uh, skills that he might be able to bring to a political campaign. And, you know, I mean, look, look at him. He's still looking pretty good. I, the thing I like about him is I keep getting older and he looks like he's still I the know. same I don't age. Know what, I don't know what kind of <laughs> lamb's blood he's drinking, but he looks great. Um, so, you know, it could, could be anything, but uh, he obviously guess? wants to be involved. What's your guess? My guess is he doesn't end up running for anything at all. Well, it doesn't pay as much as he's making now. Right. It pays a lot less. And, and, and by the way, it requires a lot. A lot of frustrating, uh, you know, efforts to get things done. Yeah. It requires a lot of deep dives into policy, um, you know, and so maybe he ends up doing it. Uh, certainly, we are in a culture right now that rewards celebrity. Uh, well, that's true. Uh, but it also might require compromise. And, well, do we do that anymore? Compromise and humility. Um, yeah. And I mean, meanwhile, he's going to make whatever, $50 million on the next movie. I mean, you could see him in a drum circle with, uh, you know, people of the other party, you know, sort of... <laughs> Knocking out the Tom Toms and uh, and uh, you know I you think I think I he's know. admitted to smoking weed in the past so you know maybe maybe try to get a peace pipe involved or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what? Stay tuned. When do we find out? Uh, you know, it's on his timetable. He's not a candidate until he is, as he might say. Okay, got to go, John. Thank you very much. Thanks, Appreciate Tom. it. Coming up, we're just learning that Melania Trump is going to make a rare public appearance at the next RNC. That's next week. More on the significance of that as rumors swirl about Mr. Trump's potential VP pick. That's next. Turning back to politics now with Republicans gearing up for their national convention kicking off in just a couple of days. Melania Trump, someone we haven't seen really at all so far this cycle, is now confirmed to attend that event in a rare public appearance. Who else could be there? Mr. Trump's future pick for VP, perhaps. With the former president late today indicating Marco Rubio, J.D. Vance, Doug Burgum, and Tim Scott are all on the list. And he's also comparing the selection process to his old reality show, The Apprentice. And an announcement could, could come at the RNC because Trump says he wants to announce next week. Let's bring in Von Hilliard for more on this. Von, we rarely see Melania Trump. What's the significance of the fact that she's showing up right now in support of her husband? Right, Tom. Donald Trump announced this third bid for the presidency all the way back in November of 2022. Melania Trump was not there that night at Mar-a-Lago when he had his big announcement rollout. And she has not appeared on the campaign trail a single day since. She did go vote with him in the Florida presidential primary earlier this year, but she never was at any one of the trial days that in which her husband was the defendant over the course of seven weeks in lower Manhattan. And she was not there the night 
night of the debate two weeks ago in Atlanta. So if, in fact, she does, as we're told she will in Milwaukee at, uh, appear at the Republican convention, this would be her first time alongside of her husband on the campaign trail. To note, it is not clear yet whether she will be speaking like she did back in the 2016 campaign. Okay, let's talk VP picks. Uh, what more do we know about whether uh, the former president, um, where he might go with this? He's hinting right now it could be, it may not be. Uh, what are you picking up? You're the guy who watches the tea leaves and reads them and whatever else you do with tea leaves, I don't know. And sometimes, you know, the leaves, they blow a little bit. And this is for Donald Trump. Two weeks ago, he said that he had the person made up in his mind. But then just today, in a radio interview, he said that there are four or five people on his mind. He named four of those individuals, Tim Scott, Marco Rubio, J.D. Vance, Doug Burgum. And he suggested that he could make his mind up potentially even on Monday, the first day of the convention. So each of these individuals we expect to come uh, to the convention, but he could announce that running mate really at any moment that he so desires to do so, Tom. Uh, and he'll do it apprentice style, apparently. This will be uh, interesting. All right. Vaughn, thank you. Vaughn Hilliard watching Thanks, it all. Friend. You can catch our live coverage of the RNC on Monday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern right here on NBC News Now. The independent candidate Robert Kennedy Jr. is also heading to Wisconsin next week to stump for votes while the Republican convention is going on. This is we're learning that he reportedly sent a text message apologizing to a woman who accused him of groping her back in 1999. It's just the latest in a string of sort of bizarre stories about Kennedy that have surfaced during the campaign. NBC's Catherine Kroteski reports now. A third party campaign gaining early traction, angling to play spoiler this election season, now hitting some major speed bumps. RFK is back in the news for reasons right. He wouldn't want to be. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. started his long shot presidential bid as a Democrat, now running as an independent. Every time you comply, you get weaker. Always controversial for his strong anti vaccine stance and support of conspiracy theories. But an article published by Vanity Fair now adding to the list of bad press to combat with numerous allegations from his past. It features a photo of Kennedy with what writers identified as a dog carcass, leading to a whirlwind of coverage, forcing him to respond. Of course, it's not a dog. And they said I was eating a dog in Korea and that they had checked with experts, uh, metadata experts, and identified it as Korea and checked with veterinarians who who validated that it was a dog and it's a goat and it's in Patagonia. Daddy would never do something like that. Kennedy now seeming to take the story in stride. It was a goat. But it wasn't the only damning news from the article, which included a sexual assault allegation. The publication reporting that Kennedy groped a former babysitter of his children, Eliza Cooney, in 1999. Cooney told her mother in 2017 and spoke with a lawyer about potentially bringing a civil suit after Kennedy declared his candidacy last year, according to the report. You're talking there about the nanny situation. I mean, I, I, I do have to ask her. I mean, are you denying it or not? I'm not going to comment on it. First reported by The Washington Post, but confirmed by NBC News, RFK Jr. reached out to Cooney in a text message two days after the Vanity Fair story, saying that he does not remember the alleged incident and apologizing for, quote, anything I ever did that made you feel uncomfortable. When The Washington Post reached out to Kennedy for a response, he said, quote, the text message speaks for itself. NBC News reached out to the campaign for comment, but did not hear back and has no record of a civil suit ever being filed. The Vanity Fair bombshells dropping while the RFK Jr. campaign was already at a low point, failing to qualify for the first presidential debate hosted by CNN in June. Kennedy not getting a bump in the polls despite President Joe Biden's struggles. Perhaps surprising after a quick start. As both major parties concerned he could shake up the race. But as early excitement gained momentum, so did anger from some family members. I am excited to vote for Joe Biden. Siblings and cousins trying to protect the Kennedy name, calling out the use of his uncle's jingle and likeness in a Super Bowl ad. And backing President Biden at the White House in March. You know, the truth is, is that I love my brother and it pains me to come out against him. But I am very concerned with the stakes in this election. Then reports of a previous health scare, first reported in May by the New York Times. Kennedy said doctors discovered he had a dead worm in his brain after experiencing memory loss and mental fogginess in 2010.
The news flying in the face of his uber fit image, trying to contrast himself with the older Trump and Biden. Kennedy is 70 years old. Now, running into technical hurdles and a cash shortfall as well. He is currently only on the ballot in 11 states, and according to the latest FEC filing from May, the campaign spent more money than raised. Thank you so much for being here today. His running mate, Nicole Shanahan, now keeping the campaign afloat. A former lawyer, entrepreneur, and ex-wife of Google founder Sergey Brin donating millions to fund the long shot bid as she keeps a low profile on the trail. But in a tight race between two major parties, even a relatively small showing for RFK Jr. could swing the election. The Democrats are frightened that I'm going to spoil the election for President Biden. Republicans are frightened that I'm going to spoil it for President Trump. The truth is, they're both right. My intention is to spoil it for both of them. And NBC's Catherine Koretsky uh, joins me now. Catherine, uh, our RFK Jr. heads to Wisconsin next week where the Republican National Convention is taking place. So what are his plans? Yeah, Tom, exactly right. So RFK Jr. headed to Wisconsin, the crucial swing state as we look ahead to November where the RNC is taking place, like you mentioned. His campaign telling me this morning that he does plan on hosting a few events. Um, he's also going to be there in front of the media where the people are. He's going to be able to talk to voters um, on Wednesday in an event focusing on farming, um, as well as a few other events that have yet to be announced. But, you know, a, a big state uh, headed into November, the RNC coming up, according to an AARP poll, uh, taken after the June 27th debate, former President Trump up slightly ahead of President Biden and RFK Jr. keeping that 9% uh, high single digit percentage, which is um, common across many polls for him. So could be a factor in this election, especially in Wisconsin. It's going to be a busy couple of days and a busy week on the campaign trail for uh, Catherine, all these I've candidates, got, Tom. I've got 10 seconds. Who is he pulling that support from? 9%. Who is he pulling it from? Trump supporters or Biden supporters? Yeah, so a poll uh, that was taken a few months ago said it was Trump. But as we get closer to November, the debate was obviously a big factor. So we'll see as time goes on. But um, okay. right now, it's former President Trump. All right, Catherine, thank you very much. Still to come from us, how demolishing dams is literally changing the landscape, bringing new life to the Pacific Northwest. That's coming up in our original. And it's a cool story. So stick around. Back now with tonight's original in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, it's the largest dam removal project ever in the U.S. Crews are taking down four dams built around 100 years ago that split up a river that ran from Oregon all the way to California. Here's the problem. The dams decimated salmon populations and toxic algae bloomed. Now the locals are hoping for a fresh start. Here's NBC's Steve Patterson. A demolition of dams. Unearthing a hundred year history of toxic algae, thousands of dead salmon, and new concerns over how to fight wildfires, all part of the long battle to bring nature back to the Pacific Northwest. Restoration of over 2,000 acres of land. California is saying it's the largest river restoration project in American history. Now, a rebirth is finally taking shape. It represents a future for our people, for kids and grandkids and generations to come. The lifeblood that once empowered the beautiful banks of the renowned Klamath River was all but lost for more than a hundred years, slowly but surely flowing again. There was a time when I didn't think I'd see this day. Leif Hillman is a member of the Karak tribe, who for generations has been fighting for something many say is vital, removing a damaging blockade of dams. I've spent the better part of my adult life um, working to remove dams on the Klamath River. According to Noah, for thousands of years, this was one of the largest salmon producing rivers on the West Coast, fueling several economies of indigenous communities. But at the turn of the 20th century, a private power company with federal permission installed four monstrous dams, fracturing the iconic waterway spanning from Oregon through California. The dams initially powered surrounding communities, including burgeoning lumber mills, but have since become operational obsolete aging structures and in the stagnant water reservoirs created by the dams bloom toxic algae. We were the first to discover this toxic algae. The salmon were decimated. The nonprofit in charge of the project, the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, estimates more than 90% of the native salmon species has been lost since the dams were installed. 
In 2002, 34 to 70,000 fish were killed almost all at once. The toxic algae was in the reservoirs. So if these dams were kept in place, the fish had a real uh, likelihood of going extinct in this watershed. Dam removal in the U.S. is at an all-time high. Over 2,100 dams have been removed since 1912, with nearly half happening in the last decade. River people stand tall. The dams are going to fall. Tribal elders, scholars, and young activists uniting in protest for decades. But there are some pain points. With wildfire season ongoing, losing reservoirs created by the dams impacts the way wildfires are fought in the region. Klamath River Renewal Corporation CEO Mark Bransom has dedicated years to finding some creative solutions, like helping to build a network of remote sensing cameras and better access points. So they have the ability to dip water from the river or to drive right down to the river's edge to fill water trucks, and that will really help replace the loss of the reservoirs as a wildfire fighting water source. The Yurok tribe is also hand planting 8.5 tons of native seeds and plans to keep going for the next three years, all while the fish are expected to usher in a new generation. This year, we'll start to see adult Chinook and Coho moving upstream, but it'll really be two to three generations before we see sustainable populations being established in those tributaries. My kids will be telling a different story. It's not going to be a story of continued decline is going to be a story of actually recovery and regaining the abundance that we once enjoyed. A renaissance of water, returning the river's sacred right back to an uninhibited freedom. NBC Steve Patterson joins me now. Steve, first of all, great job. What a great story and so important. So when will the dam removal uh, be expected to be finished? So the CEO of the project says that this should all be done, and when he means all be done, he means all be done by October, the dam completely removed. There shouldn't be a sign of a speck of any equipment or even a piece of dirt that you saw there behind them. This should be a completely free-flowing river like it was for hundreds of years come October or November. Now, what does that mean for necessarily the wildlife coming back? That's sort of a different answer. It could take generations for like the salmon to repopulate, for the vegetation to grow back after all the work they've done planting it. That's got, not going to be us. That's not going to be our children. It may be our children's children before we see the results. But the groundwork being laid and this taking down the dams, such an essential part of it. Tom? Steve, you know, you've got the corner on the wildlife stories and the, and the cool, <laughs> cool spots out of the Pacific Northwest. Good job. Keep going. It's a good, good storytelling and we need it. All right, buddy. All right. I'm lucky. Uh, well, yes, you are. Uh, you're also good. That's a wrap for this hour. Coverage resumes right now on News Now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.